our hypothesis, um, informed by prior research, is that black participants should perform worse on a T2 task, on telling us which direction the T2 is rotated than white participants because racial information is more relevant to their social identity, it's more relevant to their social um, identity contingencies. Um, in other words, they are more impaired by the attentional blink as designed by the RSVP streams. Um, and really, it should be that this uh, the attentional asymmetry is consistent across all three T1 types, uh, consistent across in-group phases and out-group phases. And also, uh, something that's unique about this study is that we included a non-traditional outgroup. Because usually, these studies are done with blacks and whites, the traditional in-group outgroup. But as a country, um, the face of our country is literally changing with more Asian Americans, with more Hispanic Americans, um, um, and with other kind of European Americans uh, coming to our country, and, and whites may not maintain the uh, majority uh, status in America uh, in, a few, in a few decades, um, I think it's important that we include non-traditional outgroups. So our experience with non-traditional outgroups is increasing. So here are the results. As you can see here on our um, x, uh, on our y-axis, is the percent of accuracy um, on, on telling us whether it's rosy to the left or to the right. And here you see repeated measures. Um, nine uh, should be six times. So you have here black participants for black white, uh, black faces, white participants for white big, uh, black faces, and so on. In the very first lab, in a, where T2 is immediately following T1 you see that it's relatively stable, and, and black participants um, are performing uh, the same uh, for all three phases. White participants are performing the same uh, relatively for the um, three types of phases. At lab two, this is where it's interesting. This is where participants start to recover from the attentional blink, and this is where we can measure the attentional asymmetry. And what you find is that black participants recover from the attention, attention of blink much later than white participants. So at lag 2, they're performing pretty much the same as at lag 1. But white participants are doing much better at lag 2 than they were at lag 1. And at lag 4, you see um, that it's pretty much the same as lag 2. So what this tells us that is that uh, when we ran uh, repeated measures in NOVA, is that there's a main effect of lag. So meaning that participants are performing differently at the different three labs, telling us that um, our manipulation of the attentional blink worked. And there was a significant uh, between subject um, effect of race. So white participants were performing much better on the T2 task, recovering from attentional blink much better than, uh, than black participants. And as expected, there's an interaction between black and the race of the participants. Now this is the interesting part. There was only a moderate effect of T1 type. So how whether it's a black face, a white face, or an Indian face didn't significantly affect how participants perform on this task. So what can we conclude? Uh, we can conclude that yes, there is an automatic attentional process that's facilitating the three attentional uh, asymmetries that we discussed earlier. And remember, these asymmetries are at a conscious level, something that you can control. Um, and it's unique in, in the sense that we expanded the idea of the algorithm to include Asian Indians. And the reason we didn't choose, say, Hispanics or Native um, Americans is because it's hard to tell from a face whether um, it's a Hispanic or a white, because sometimes uh, Hispanic faces are rather ambiguous. So to maintain consistency, uh, we use um, Indians because their faces are, are, are rather unique and rather distinctive and it's easy to tell that's an Indian. So the implications of this study. We started with something funny at the beginning, right? That you have here a powerless secretary attending more to a powerful editor, but the powerful editor is not paying as much attention to the powerless except for when she messes up, right? Um, but in all seriousness, um, this study is an important first step towards understanding um, whether racial differences in attentional asymmetries exist um, at an automatic level and what the motivational and cognitive sources of these differences are. Racial relations in America are improving, but they're not perfect. 
Um, so it is important to see uh, what kind of attentional asymmetries at, at, at a very automatic level are, are at play. And without threat, at an unconscious automatic level, blacks are tending more to racially relevant information than, than whites. So this tells us that the black experience, rendered at least in part by historical and present um, inequalities and imbalances of power, they seem to um, be more attentive, more vigilant to their surroundings, especially when it's something that is relevant to their identity, something relevant to their outcome, um, to their success. And you know what's I think the most interesting thing about about this study is that when there is no threat present, when you do not know that, that this is happening, you still see this attentional difference. Um, and you still see that blacks have to be, or I, I guess blacks are more vigilant than whites, even though they don't really know that this is happening, and, and even though there's no reason to be, because the outcome is not contingent on their performance on this task, and their identity should not be threatened by this task. Um, so it's very interesting that we found this, and oops, there's supposed to be a future research uh, slide, uh, but there's not, so I'll just tell you what our future research is. Uh, we want to look at what happens when there is threat, when you're presented with, instead of neutral expression, uh, faces with neutral expressions, you're um, presented with angry faces. So I think our intuition would tell us that when that is the case, you would be more attentive, whether you're white or black, to angry outgroup faces than you are to angry in-group faces. Um, so that's a hypothesis that, that we would like to test with our future um, study and something that we're going to run this summer. So I have all these wonderful people to thank uh, for, for their support and thank you for listening. And now the floor is open. Has a corresponding experiment been conducted with male and female, and male and female face? Now, okay, so that, that's an interesting question. Um, to control variability, we use all male faces this time, um, because there was just so many variables, right? You have three levels. We didn't want to introduce a fourth level for a first study, because this is really the first study to show um, this attentional asymmetry at an automatic level. We didn't how about, know. How about the difference? in the distraction caused by a male face and a female face. Right, so that's something that, that we can look uh, for in the future, but my, uh, I think my gut feeling is that the, the racial information is more um, interesting or more relevant um, than, I say, the, the gender information. How do you reconcile this with other studies that have found an attentional bias towards young, for white perceivers for young black faces? I, I think that the, the, the thing about the, those studies is that um, it's a detection task as opposed to a, um, a disengagement task. Okay. So, so it is not consistent with that, right, um, in the sense that, that whites are quicker to find black faces than they are to find white faces. But being quicker to detect something in an, in an environment um, could be different from actually disengaging from it at an automatic level. From what I recall in the Devil Wear Prada, yes. um, initially she did not pay any attention to her because, as you said, she wasn't relevant. Right. But at the end, she did rely on her. And she, uh, is that because she started to dress up? She started to dress the part? I, I, look like her. I, I think what happens there is really outcome, right? Her outcome is now, um, be, yes, beginning to depend more on the, the, the secretary, right? Because this secretary is more, more knowledgeable, is more quick on her feet. Um, so so it's, I, I think there is really the, the outcome uh, dependence that, that, that's out there. And that's something that, that Susan's this research has really shown. It's, it's, it's not necessarily you know, your position as much as it is in your outcome, but it, is, it tends to correlate right, your position and, and your uh, outcome dependency. Thank you very much.